Okay, cool. We're at the base retreat for uh, the next interview in the lineup. Um, we have Ronnie Lee and Louise Ryan. Uh, Ronnie, I don't really know much about you, and I'm sure a lot of people watching might not know too much about you. All most people hear is that you're the founder of the ALF Animal Liberation Front. So, is that is that a fairly accurate roundup? Well, I will say I'm, I always actually say I'm one of the founders. I'm the best known um, of of the founders of the Animal Liberation Front. The Animal Liberation Front, uh, in actual fact, um, uh, was founded in um, 19, uh, 1973. But when it was founded, it was first of all known as the Band of Mercy. It wasn't called the Animal Liberation Front. And the Band of Mercy was actually the name of an RSPCA youth group in the 18th century. And they were really quite militant. They did things like damaging guns that were going to be used by shooters to kill animals. And so um, when we when we formed the group, there were six of us all together. When we formed the group, we wanted to recreate that spirit. So we called ourselves the Band of Mercy. And then three years later, the name was changed to the Animal Liberation Front. So, yeah, well, well, what is the Animal Liberation Front? Uh, the Animal Liberation Front um, was, and, 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 and still is, because it's, it's still going, um, n not nearly as much as it used to, but it still continues. Um, the, the Animal Liberation Front um, is a direct action organisation, um, carry, carrying out direct action in the cause of animal liberation. And, and, and there's basically two, um, two strands to that. One is damage to property, um, at um, establishments where animals are oppressed. And the second strand uh, is the rescue of animals, taking animals out of those places. Right. That's quite specific. I, yeah. was, I wasn't aware of the, the damage to property stuff. That's a yes. bit, that's a bit, ooh, uh, um, yeah, what can you say about that? Um, well, that was done... Um, how it all started, and, and, and the reason why the, the, the Band of Mercy was formed was um, because um, the, the, the people involved in forming the Band of Mercy were, were hunt saboteurs. We were, we were people who were in, involved in hunt sabotage. And there's a form of hunting that takes place early in the, in, in the hunting season, fox hunting season, which basically involves the massacre of, of young foxes, of fox cubs, by the foxhounds in order to give the hounds a taste of blood. And basically what happens is the hunt will surround a wood and they, uh, when the, the young foxes have been out hunting with their parents during the night, um, members of the hunt block up the fox earth so they can't go back underground. So they're above ground, they surround the wood and they send the hounds in just to massacre the foxes um, to wow. give them a taste of blood. And because there's <clears> no <throat> chase involved as in conventional you know your normal fox hunting so to speak yeah it's not it's very difficult to to do anything about it because you can't really intervene because you, you know we would be massively outnumbered by members of the hunt yeah so you so it was really frustrating you were standing there and you couldn't do anything to save these foxes so if you ever started thinking well we need to do something about this we need to find another method of stopping this and we came up with the idea of going to the hunt kennels, you know, the hunt headquarters in the early hours of the morning before one of these cup hunts and damaging their vehicles so they couldn't actually go out yep. later in the morning. And that's where it came. We couldn't do that as a Hunt Saboteurs Association because the Hunt Sabs, um, it's their policy really to operate within the law. Yeah, It might be borderline, but they still try to operate within the law. But yeah. we were clearly breaking the law. And so we had to form a different organisation in order to do that. And that's where the Band of Mercy came from. So that's how it started. And then it progressed to attacking other forms of animal oppression. Yeah. For instance, we tried to, to attempted to destroy a, an animal research laboratory that was being built in Milton Keynes. Um, we attacked a couple of boats that were going to be used for hunting baby seals, killing baby seals up on the wash in Lincolnshire. Yeah. Uh, we destroyed one and badly damaged the other, for instance. And then we uh, began a campaign against people who bred and supplied animals to laboratories. We, we, were, we were kind of given a, a list of these places by a sympathiser and we right. used it as a hit list. Yeah. And we went around um, 
mainly damaging their vehicles so to stop them transporting the animals yeah and so that's how it progressed yeah so it's a bit um it's, it's it at first it sounds a little bit contradictory because you've got a compassionate act of liberating animals then you've got a, a violent act of, of sabotaging property uh, and that kind of thing it depends so. on the definition of violence is damage to property violence i mean we, we 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 had a strict policy and that policy still exists within the animal liberation front uh, that we we wouldn't call you know we, we would do our utmost not to harm uh any living thing it, it, whether those were were humans or other animals so it was non-violent in that sense but in terms of property we would damage property and it's whether damage to property i mean i i i think damaging property in order to save life is totally justified and i, I don't think it's really right to call it violence yeah yeah I, I I understand that, yeah, but I'm I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, yes, <laughs> clarity, I mean, yeah, yeah. the the LF has been accused of being violent, and that's kind of something I I dispute really. Yeah, because it's not against, like you say, not against living beings. It's against no, property. N- n- um, yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, it's for the greater good, isn't it? Uh, and, and that as well. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. So uh, <clears throat> it seems to be uh, th- that's been the concept of the ALF uh, from the beginning. Yes. Um, so what's the view on on um campaign or the drive to do things like um make legal challenges or judicial review and, and that kind of approach what's the alf uh, view on, on that well um that, that kind of isn't really an uh, alf the, the, the alf uh, wasn't and isn't a group that would really have a a view on that because um, the, the, the ALF is is a um, and always has been a decentralised leaderless um, organisation. Yeah. I suppose there's a very um, sexy word to me. S- I, I love I love that. Yeah. yeah. So that's the special yeah. thing about the ALF, and that's yes. the thing that causes a bit of confusion. Yes. So uh, it, it doesn't have specific membership, does it? And, and, no. People be, people become members of the ALF by carrying out. Um, I mean, we all said that we wanted. To you know that that really it was kind of would be hypocritical for somebody to carry an alf action uh, and uh, unless they were vegan or at least vegetarian probably these days it it would be vegan in the old <laughs> days it was kind yeah. of veganism wasn't so common um also also it wasn't so easy to live as a vegan now it's it's really easy um and so so there was that that kind of unwritten rule that we wanted activists really to you know we didn't want them to be we wanted them to refrain from involvement in the oppression of other animals themselves in their own lives of course first of all before going out and doing something about what other people are doing yeah um and it's um yeah it was um pe- people became um members of the alf through their actions through carrying out alf actions and anyone could claim to be an alf member if if they did that type of action yeah there was no payment of fees and signing people up and lists of people or anything like that yeah so Uh, is there anything that's kind of official or material about about the alf like is there a is there a publication or did there used to be like a magazine or whatever uh, yeah that there for, for for many years um there's been a publication called the uh alf supporters group newsletter um which uh, I mean, that didn't that wasn't started right at the beginning. I think that that um, because the ALF dates from seventy three, really, and then the yeah. sports group newsletter I think dates from the early eighties, and it was basically a um, a publication for you know for people that want to support the ALF in various ways, either through supporting prisoners or in the early days people could could donate money to pay for crowbars and <laughs> bolt cutters and yeah. stuff like that. I mean. That doesn't happen now, you know, for legal reasons, because it kind of that was used to, to prosecute people. The fact that that was part of it, so that it's, it's still a prisoner support organisation. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of stuff in. I mean, if people want to um, learn about the history, um, there's there's a website called the Talon Conspiracy. If people look up Talon Conspiracy on an internet search, I just that first bit. Talon. Talon. T a l o n right conspiracy okay and um on that website that there are kind of back issues of lots of 
magazines relating to animal liberation and animal rights. And on there, uh, they, they've got all the, the back copies of the ALF supporters group newsletter. So if people take a look at that, they learn an awful lot about the ALF, including the, the massive number of actions that used to take place. Yeah, yeah. So you, you said it was, it's, it's decentralized and leaderless. Uh, <clears throat> how important is that? What is that and how important is it? Well, well that was, that was uh, really important. It, it was, it, it's important and, and it's still important to the extent that the ALF still exists um, in two ways. First of all, to enable it to spread rapidly and to spread everywhere, because if all people had to do to be an ALF member and to be an ALF a activist was to carry out, was to believe in animal liberation and to carry out a particular type of action, it's very, it's really easy for people to get involved, and and so hmm. it, it start it started uh, in England, but it rapidly spread throughout the world because of the ease of people just you know, doing the same thing in, in whatever country they lived. So, so it led to, uh, you know, it enabled it to spread rapidly. And, and secondly, it made it more difficult um, for the authorities to do anything about it. Because wasn't the, if there's a leader that's giving all the orders and that leader's arrested and put in prison and silenced, then that's the end of the organisation. But if it's decentralised, you can't, there's no head that you can cut off to kill the organisation. Yeah. And so it was a great way of, of kind of, I mean, they made out that, you know, they made out, I, I was involved in a, in, a, in a court case where they made out I was the big leader yeah. and they <laughs> called me the general and I got 10 years I, in I prison. Think, I think that might be to do with your name because your name just sounds like that kind of person. <laughs> it's a great well, name. No, Gen yeah. General, general Ronnie Lee is a general. Well, 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 in, in fact, as a joke, I mean, my, um, uh, for instance, my Skype name is General Ronnie Lee. Okay. My Facebook address is general I, I use it as a joke because yeah. it was a joke I mean, it was nonsense yeah um but they they because they wanted to give me a big sentence they said this man was the general he organized everything i mean that's completely untrue yeah and I, I i mean i instigated things i encouraged people yes but but like i wasn't some you know big all controlling leader and nor did i want to be because that would that would have actually held things back and of course when they put me in prison Think stuff still carried on. People still did things. Didn't me, need me to be giving everyone orders to, to do it. And so it kind of it it, it kind of it stopped the authorities from um, you know made it harder for the authorities to put an end to ANF actions. Yeah. So it was decentralised and leaderless from the beginning. Yes. But at the time that was conceived, was that a novel thing? Um, and did that come from somewhere? Was it inspired by something? I, yeah. well, well, I think I think it it, it kind of was inspired um, by anarchism. It was, um, um, you know, the idea of kind of, you know, a leaderless resistance and having autonomous cells or autonomous um, groups of people way? doing things. Um, I mean, I I, I I I was really quite inspired by a group called the Angry Brigade, who were they mm. weren't exactly anarchists. I mean, they were socialists, but they were kind of you know very close i think to you know to be an anarchist and they carried out actions uh in england i think in the i think it probably would have been in the early 70s and they they you know attacked targets to do with, they, they i think they attacked a lot of targets to spain because it was at the time it was the franco um the fascist uh, dictator right was ruling spain and <clears> so <throat> they, they did and, and they they kind of did other things like they attacked um, um, a broadcast um, van at the Miss World contest as a, like a you know to kind of as, as well as an attack on sexism for instance right and so it was much broader than the normal left wing thinking you know yeah. they were kind of going into other issues yeah and that and that kind of um, that really interested me because of course animal liberation is like. You know, to me, it's a kind of left-wing issue, but it's outside the normal, you know, sphere of what the left covers. You see, so I thought, yeah, you know, these people are kind of thinking outside the box, and let's take this a bit further and kind of, you know, do stuff for animals. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 really cool. Um, yeah, I love the fact that it's uh, the, the the decentralized, and that's a, a, a that is appearing in a lot of modern internet technologies. This concept of 
um, being decentralized and, and peer-to-peer networks and things like that, which yeah. are deliberately dispersed and don't have a leader. And it gives a lot of resilience to yes. the thing, to the network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, it gave resilience to the AF. I mean, in, in the end, the, the, the ALF the, the ALF has been greatly diminished, uh, especially, especially in here country, in the UK. Yeah, especially in the UK. Yeah. <clears throat> and there are various reasons for that. I mean, one, one of the big reasons is CCTV. Yeah. That you can't. I mean, our idea was to do. We weren't, we weren't suicide attackers, you know. Our idea was to kind of, you know, uh, you to, wouldn't have had many people <laughs> doing have many, that. You left now, you wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but our idea was to, to live to fight another day, to carry out an action, and then to, you know, and and so we we did, you know, try to avoid a arrest when we. But it's so difficult to, you know, now when you've got CCT everywhere and track someone from one end of the country to another. It would yeah. be, you know, as, and I think uh, the UK is the most surveilled country in the world in that in that sense, and so that's just one reason. There are other reasons as well. So, do you um, think that energy has moved somewhere else, or not? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, people still uh, people are still you know campaigning for animal liberation in various ways. Yeah. So I think it it, it, it kind of has, but you see, I think there's there's um, been a, a shift in how younger people operate and this is another reason I think for possibly the decline in ALF activity is that um, <clears throat> younger people in those days when you go back to the, like, the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s for instance were kind of seem to be sort of more politically aware more aware of issues outside their own personal self-interest yeah, I mean, a hell of a lot of young people still were, but but more yeah. young people seem to be kind of m- more, you know, thinking outside of just themselves and um, you know thinking about issues, you know, to do with you know social justice and stuff yeah, it's like the that. Same like universities and stuff back in the kind of nineties and and kind of eighties, you know, a lot of them were radical places and. You know, they'd have things at fresher weekends and stalls and things like that. So it was a kind of roadway in. I mean, I remember being very young in the kind of late 80s and 90s. And that's kind of when I came into animal rights. And, you know, there was a lot of people coming through my age that were really kind of raw. And, you know, they wanted to know more. And you got the back of kind of Green and Commons who were... And they were your mum and dad's age, and if they mm. were left wing, then they were kind of for them. You know, they were for the women at Greenham, and you know, you had the miners' strike, and all of it was very edgy. All of it was very in your face, and it was on the news, and so it wasn't. You kind of fed through the kind of movement. You kind of fed through all of that. It was a gateway into other social issues, but then animal rights was very important to that so you fed into that kind of group and so your kind of radical roots and radical kind of leanings were still there because your mum and dad were often that way so you came into the movement so it wasn't a strange thing to kind of do at our ages were you know back then were kind of 18 and 19 so it wasn't uncommon to to still have that rawness and that edginess and because your mum and dad were a bit like that um and and you wanted to be with your own kind of group at that age and the alf wasn't a strange kind of feeling either it was kind of Mm. whoa like how can we do this can we do that Mm. and that's kind of where it fed um and and i think that's where it's massively different now yeah yeah Yeah. You, you, you don't get the young the demographic then yeah was much younger in other words, the ALF, it was, it was very, it, it was all kind of young people, you know, like people late teens, early twenties mostly. Yeah. Um, and you occasionally get a person who was older, but it was quite rare. I mean, you know, the older people tended to support with with money. You'd get you'd get kind of elder, elderly people giving us their pension to you know, pay <laughs> yeah. for aids and that. Yeah. But you know that was <laughs> overwhelming with young people. But like, kind of, if if you look at the demographic now on on kind of like, for instance, Camp Beagle and and. Um, you do get some young people, but they're mostly older people now. Yeah, uh, and and where are the young where have the young people gone? You see, and I think um, one big cause of it was like, you know, going back to Margaret Thatcher, the you know, Margaret Thatcher government, which I think was in the. Um, <clears throat> it would have been a 
mid 80s well, well, she's the 70s, 80s, was it? 80s. <clears throat> that, that yeah, kind of it, it was very much she very much kind of pushed the view you know look after number one you know look after yourself your family you know don't be interested in issues outside of that and that that's been, that's an idea that's been perpetuated with government after government and kind of has kind of seeped into society and I think has affected young people. Yeah, it's so like consumerist and It's selfish. like consumerist, you know, yeah. ne- neoliberalism and all these things that kind of, it, it's very materialistic, very look, look after number one. Yeah. And, it, and and that has kind of affected, I think has affected young people. You still get some great young people, of course, but it's, you, you don't get the numbers now that you used to. Also, uh, I think, I think from, from, if you look at the governments across the world, they've actually become much more dogmatic and restrictive and more violent we've actually become the combatant the public have become the enemy yeah. to the governments so when you're on the streets when you get arrested if you do then you're looking at possibly um you know if you're a young person you've got to watch because everything you do from that moment on can affect your life choices, your chances, everything um, regarding jobs, regarding future um, times to to your own life. Because yeah. you can seriously, seriously, you know, screw things up for yourself. And you are acutely aware of all of that being mixed in the mix of, of now the pressure that's put on people to find jobs to keep a roof over their head to pay their bills even if you're a student it's a struggle so all the time all the time we're almost being held back in this invisible chain like cloak all of us are to some degree being held back by that because our governments are becoming very autocratic very kind of stilted stunted you will do this you won't do that yeah we will crush you if you do this Mm. And so, and that's something that's being fed through really kind of in the last sort of decade, really, you've seen real kind of austere kind of things coming in from the government. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing changes to laws again that you wouldn't have seen, like holding banners and boards, you know, whether that's illegal, whether they can make it illegal. And that is being fed through global governments as well like in china with hong kong and all the students there so of course they hold everybody by fear you know by this kind of fear if you go against what we want you to do yeah then we will kick your ass and we will make you suffer and so that's also a problem that you've actually got and this is why i think there's a kind of deadening to certain things and um, with, with with the youngsters, I think they're acutely aware that if they go outside those boundaries, in a group, I think, yeah, they can do it, but you will be crushed. So that they're, will... they're much more un- under manners, as they say. Yeah, kind yeah. of. That I think they are. I yeah. think they are. And, and social media's played a part because I think people in the old days, we didn't have social media. If you wanted to protest against something, you had to part of be out there and go there. Now, I, th- I think... People think, oh, well, I can put a post about it. I can sign an online petition, and I can stay at home. <laughs> yeah, armchair uh, activist. Armchair activist, but, but yeah. No. But at the same time, that the thing that you're doing can be so easily censored and muted. Yeah, I, I, I think there's there's a the, the um, there's a misconception probably about the effectiveness of a lot of social media stuff. I think some of it can be very effective. A lot of it kind of gives an appearance appearance of doing something when it actually really doesn't mm-hmm. and so i think social media is very much a in terms of activism and actually bringing about animal liberation it's very much a double-edged sword can help in some ways but it kind of hinders things a lot in other ways as well yeah yeah people are feeling that pressure like you say from the state more and more yeah there's a combination of there's a yeah. whole combination of reasons why uh, uh, there's less activism and and why fewer young people are involved in it it's yeah. not just one thing it's the, all these things coming together that's you know, created the situation their parents are going to be saying things like you know you watch out you don't yeah. do that be careful of that yeah because if you actually look at the older activists like you have in animal rebellion and extinction rebellion many of them are retired and many of them 
have decided that they want to get back into activism. They were activists when they were younger. Yeah. They had children, they had homes, they had jobs, so they gave that up and now they're going back to it. Gu the Guardian did a very good article about it, how many yeah. of the older generation are coming back into activism because they now know that they can lose what they've got in a sense if they get arrested it's not too much of a problem the state is not going to necessarily lean down on them as heavily as they would do with the young so you've got a lot more to lose you know when you're young than you have when you're older i'm not saying it's easy and i'm not saying it would mm. be a walk in the park mm. but i do think that's that's yeah. an interesting kind of demographic. Also, uh, when you're older, you've seen it for so much longer, and the kind of, really the the the, the anger and uh, it kind of has been there. It's, it's a lot longer. It's much more manifested. Yeah, and you can see a picture just getting more and more clear about what's what is happening with the state and, yeah. and the populace. Yes, I, I mean this is why I I believe very strongly that we kind of have to sort of we have to take the state. I mean, I, I kind of, I, I'm, I'm an, um, an anarchist in, in the sense of the sort of society I'd like to see. Yeah. But I kind of describe myself really as an eco-socialist because I think part of getting that society is con taking control of the state and dismantling it. Okay, so, so, so that, that might sound really radical and, and like yeah. kind of scary to people. Well, let's start with what is... What is anarchism, as as you said? What's the general concept there? Well, well anarchism is, is is in some ways an, an application to society of kind of how the ALF kind of operated and operates. That it, it's it's like it, it's kind of um, it, it, it's the the idea that you don't have you, you, you don't have states, you don't have nation states. You know, we have a world that's made up of lots of nation states. And and, yeah. and and these are completely, it's ludicrous really, because the reason we have them is really, they come back through violence. You've had kings or robber barons or other you know, violent people have claimed, you know, a, a piece of land, an area of land by force, you know, historically, you know, you know, sometimes it's ancient history and sometimes it's more modern. Yeah. And yeah. they've said, well, this is, you know, this is my state. I, I rule this. I rule the people here, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, these, these, these borders are completely false. They've just been kind of created by somebody through violence. And, and really, you know, they, in, a, in a decent world, you would, you would not have nation states. You'd have to have administration. Obviously, things have to be organised. But you wouldn't have all these different states. And, of course, having all these different states is the reason we have wars, because you have, you know, at the moment you've got Russia attacking Ukraine, haven't you? And you've had, you know, yep. all these states going in. So, 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 you know, this is the, you know, a, you know, one of the fundamental cause of war as nation it's states. Like, it's like having different gangs, isn't it? It's like, yeah, but basically it is. They're gang leaders and all that. Right, so kind of, you yep. know, in some countries... Is a kind of semblance of democracy, but there's still nation states, and there's still, you know, Boris Johnson's a gang leader, for instance. Yeah, you know, they all are. Um, and and so we need to we, we we need to see an end to that. I mean, it's a, an irrational situation, as, as as well as being, you know, hugely harmful um, to humans, and and indeed I'd say harmful to other animals as well to have the existence of nation states. And so we need a society without that, we need a society, you have to have administration, you have to have organisation of society, but that kind of needs to be done in, in, a, in a truly democratic way and, and in a way where, um, you know, you have fair representation and you have, um, you have organisation right down to the, you know, the smallest, the smallest level. Um, and that would be very much like um, an anarchist model, really, of, of, how, of, of how society would be run, of how the, you know, human society in the world would operate. And I, you know, I very much believe in that. But it's really a question of like, kind of, how do we get there? You know, what road do we take to kind of get there? And I think I believe, personally, part of getting there is you have to kind of, you know, you, you have to kind of, take control of the state and then you dismantle it to move towards that kind of decentralized society. Now, I, I think that's the most practical way of doing it. I mean, the, there are those that would disagree, you know, anarchists would disagree with that and say that you kind of create a kind of s s somehow smash the state. I don't really understand what kind of how you do that or what that means, you know, for instance. I, I mean, to me, and, and, and so therefore, that kind of does 
does mean involvement in conventional politics. So you get, you know, you know, politicians that elected that really want to change things, including changing the nature of the state eventually. And if we're going to, if we're going to get those people elected, we they have to be voted in. And so you, you kind of, you know, why have we got the appalling government we've got at the moment, you know, here in the UK? It's because almost 30% of the electorate voted for them. They, they, they didn't come by magic. They were yeah. voted in. And so if you're going to change, you know, the nature of government, um, in the nature of, you know, politics, nature of political system, you've got to change ordinary people. Yeah. You have to change ordinary people. And so how do you change ordinary people? And, and fundamentally, I believe the way to change ordinary people is through vegan education. And I think that's why vegan education is so vitally important because it goes to the very foundation of everything. And, I mean, not just in politics, but in terms of the effect that people can have through that change in their consumer habits, through that change in their lifestyle, yeah, you know, can have a huge effect. The, the main you, problem yeah, is greed, not, power and money. That's what's leading yeah, to all and, the corruption. And, and, and the antidote yeah. literally is like the altruistic thing of putting animals first. Well, well, well you know, there, there, are all, there are all sorts of terrible forms of oppression in the world of, of you know, humans against humans. Yeah. Um, but in terms of you know numbers, in terms of the you know the extent of the slaughter and suffering, yeah, the oppression of other animals by humans is is massively, massively, massively greater by than many, anything by many that orders, humans yeah. do to mm. to other humans. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something about the terrible things humans do to other humans. Of course, we should. But the number one priority should be animal liberation because by, that is by you know. It, probably a trillion fold the biggest you know greatest form of oppression yeah you know by our species and and because we are members of an oppressor species you know I've, it's our duty to do something about that to do something about what our species has done and what continues you know, you know we continue to do to other animals and that's why for me activism is 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 a kind of duty it is is a is a is a moral imperative and it's the most important thing that anyone can do, in, you know, to spread the vegan message, educate other people to go vegan, so that we can eventually turn things around. And we have to, we have to go to that fundamental level of operation, changing ordinary people. We're never going to change everyone, but we don't have to change everyone. We only have to change enough people so that we become more or less the dominant force. We're the ones that call the shots. You know, we're the ones that, you know, that are able to mould society. And you don't need a majority to do that. I mean, you need a lot of people. Kind of, um, kind of getting to kind of that situation. It's only in if it's kind of infancy, and that's with the uh, extinction rebellion, climate change, all of that coming in. You know, because we realise that we are running out of time for massive change, and of course, veganism is really at the heart of that. I mean, there's going to be environmentalists that might kind of say, oh, no, 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 you don't have to do that. But really, you do have to do that if you really want to see change in our world from the ground up and truly to have compassion for all living creatures on this planet, the animal kingdom, from land to sea, then we do need to change. And that's only happening now because we're so worried about our own arses really is again very very human centric how mm. we deal with it but really fundamentally the vegan message is is right at its heart and however much politicians or anyone argues over that the truth is we've all got to be vegan uh to, and you know change will come for the animals when we start to learn that taking their lives and trashing them the way we have and our earth mother is 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 crucial to change for all of us we have to have that otherwise we're never going to learn the lessons yeah. that we should be learning and, and from past as well the atrocities that have gone on you know that's true what, so what, she, what do you think about system change versus individual change uh, individual change creates system change yeah yeah. Um, the thing is that you see that I mean I support what Extinction Rebellion are doing I support what Animal Rebellion are doing 
I think they kind of will to some extent move things in the right direction. But the problem is all the time, groups like that, that pressure groups, you know, there's pressure campaigns. Um, and you get two sorts of pressure campaigns. You get pressure campaigns that are aimed at companies, organisations. You get pressure campaigns that are aimed at the governments. And, um, um, you know, both those campaigns yeah, um, do both. But in terms of kind of trying to change government policy, the problem is, is you're up against governments that have an ideology, a fundamental ideology that is totally opposed to what we want. Mm. Their ideology is totally opposite to what we want. So the extent that you can move them is kind of really limited. And, yeah. and the resistance that you're going to face in trying to move them is huge because because of that ideology that they have. And so all that, all those I support efforts to do that, I think that really you're only going to create re really radical and fundamental change. If, if you change the very nature of government, if you change the people that are in government, if you change the people that run the show, so that they become much more sympathetic and, and in agreement with what we want. I mean, and, you know, I do think, I mean, butting in there, yeah. you know, there is a part of me that thinks in years to come, probably when we're not even around, I think you, you could even have a situation where it is so bad that it, it turns into armed war you know to save the environment i really do feel that sometimes because you just seem to be we all seem to be hitting our heads up against a brick wall whatever you try it just seems to carry on the same even with the pandemic you were thinking maybe there is a different way of going about things look there's mm. less cars on the road yeah people are trying to think of each other a bit more yeah you know we're all trying to share for, at a community level we're all trying to take care of each other this is new this is a bit kind of out there you know fantastic yeah. you know yeah. maybe the governments can see while we're all at home how the world can be and and you know there's less pollution and Oh my God! You can see the Taj Mahal in India, and for the first time, <laughs> isn't this fantastic? Yeah. And you know, wow! Look at New York; it's got clear air, and oh wow! And then all of a sudden, it kind of goes back to the way it was before. We're now back to the way that we were: no change, no nothing. Everybody gets back in their cars, acts the same as they've always done. Bang! It's all over, and you think what a shame what a chance what an opportunity we could have all kind of if that had carried on just that bit longer maybe it would have opened a door where we could have been more compassionate and more considerate towards the environment and the animals within it yeah you know i mean i even pictured creatures dancing in the road at midnight you know <laughs> like doing like little yeah. maypole dances going the humans have gone the humans have gone woo -hoo, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. well they kind of did <laughs> they did they, it come into know, areas didn't they, they certain did areas, come into areas because yeah. it was yeah. all quieter but yeah. but you see yeah. i i kind of think that um that the you know in terms of that that demand system change if you're going to if you're going to really people are just people will just go back to what they were doing before unless there's you know it, it, encouragement from governments for them to behave differently and there hasn't been any you know the government's rapidly wanted us to go back to business as usual because that's more profit for them and their mates isn't it yeah that's why you see and so unless you change that unless you fundamentally change you know the nature of government or the nature of the administration so should we say then you're you're never gonna we're never gonna really be able to climb very far out of the hole that we're in and once again you know to change that you have to change ordinary people and i'd say you know this is why for me that you know um vegan education is so vital and it's, it's fundamental that we um and that as many vegans as possible are involved in it um i think that's really important i think what what the problems we have these days is that but, you know, back in the day, you know, going back to the 70s and the 80s, there were far fewer people that were vegan. But yeah. if you spoke to a vegan then, there was a 95% chance that they were an activist. And most all vegans were activists oh, back right. in the day. Yeah. Now, there's probably a 95% chance, 99% chance that <laughs> they're kind of not. Yeah. And, and I think that's tragic because we have so much mm. potential. Now, these, I mean, if people's like a, you know, a genuine vegan, in other words, veganism is a philosophy of animal liberation. So if you're going to be, 
somebody that just eats a vegan diet isn't necessarily vegan, you know, because unless they, you know, yeah, because it can mean a lot uh, more than than just the dietary foodie it, side it, of it. Yeah, yeah and it, it is a lot more than that. It, it is, is a philosophy, it is a philosophy and a way of and life and everything else. So somebody that does it just for the health, they're kind of not really vegan. They're a plant eater. To be vegan, you've got to believe in well, animal liberation. This really. is where my yeah. my kind of age group comes in. Yeah. Because for us, when we were young, the animal liberation front and the animal liberation message was very much wrapped up in veganism. You weren't one without the other. You know, yeah. that, that was it. You, you were a vegan and you were an animal liberationist. Mm. You were into the animal liberation front. You believed that. It was your philosophy and that's what you stuck to and that was fundamental now it it's not and again it's it's that funny kind of thing that we're all in where things are held back or they're stripped away or they're it's manipulated it's um you know big business has taken it over it's removed removed her teeth her strength in a way mm. to me veganism is much much more than just going and getting an Alpro yogurt from Sainsbury's. Mm, Fundamentally, yeah. you know, it is totally about uh, ending speciesism and giving <laughs> animals their their rights. Like we have our rights, they should have theirs. Mm, I've spoke, a, a few people I've, I've spoken to about this <clears throat> have said that they, they've gone, they've become vegan, and then they've become activist. And then when they're activists, they they have this feeling that the the veganism thing is a kind of like a, just a baseline it's not it's not anything major special it's like that's that's where you need to be starting that's a yes. starting point yes in, in terms of the diet i mean, mean, mean veganism you know according to its you know proper definition is much more than a diet and would include mm. everything it, it, you know it is a, 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 a philosophy and a liberation um in 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 that its opposition to speciesism and human supremacism and it's wanting animals to be liberated from human tyranny you know that is veganism that's what vegan and and it's it's what it's always meant i mean the, the guy that um um coined the definition of veganism leslie cross who, hmm. who did so in 1951 he was an animal liberationist i mean yeah. you know he wasn't an alf you don't, you don't have to be an alf person to be an animal, animal liberationist in terms of a philosophy yeah, he was. You, you know, he, he, he wanted animals yeah. freed from oppression and exploitation. It wasn't just the diet. The diet's a really important part of it because most ordinary people, the, the, the thing that most ordinary people, you know, do in their everyday life that contributes to the oppression of other animals is through their consumption of animal products. And most people don't go hunting. Most people aren't vivisectors. Most people, you know, kind of... <laughs> you know, sort of aren't involved in, you know, these other forms of animal oppression, but they consume animal products. And so they're kind of, and and I think there's also an environmental, in another big area um, in terms of um, the oppression of other animals is adverse human impact on the environment. And, mm. you know, of course we've got the climate crisis and billions of other animals are dying already because of the climate crisis. They're the main, they take the main hit, it isn't humans. And that's another way in which our species oppresses other animals and it's a huge area and, and, and should be a huge area of concern to all vegans. Um, but you see, but, but like most people, it is the consumption of animal products. And so to get people away from that, they've taken a big step on that journey towards the philosophy of animal liberation and we just need to take them further on that, on that journey. But in order to do that... Um, we have to have far more vegans becoming activists, far more vegans kind of doing outreach. And the other really important thing is that we need far more vegans to become instigators of outreach and organisers of outreach. Because, I mean, there is, there's quite a lot that people can do their own. I mean, I, I kind of, I always carry leaflets around with me and I leave them on public transport, I leave them in public places, I leave yeah. them in magazines. You know, the solo activism, a lot of people <clears throat> could do, anyone <throat> could do solo activism as a vegan, it can be very effective. But there's a lot of things where you need more people. If you're doing an information store, for instance, um, quite often it depends on the situation, you'll need more than one person. So it's handy to have a group of people. And we need groups of um, vegan activists doing outreach everywhere. 
Um, and the situation we have at, at, at the moment is that nearly all outreach takes place in the centre of big cities. You have yeah. these, you know, you have um, Cube of Truth or you have um, an Earthlings experience or something like that or mm. one of these other events uh, going on there. Um, and that's brilliant. It's great that that's happening. But what about all the other places? You know, what about the smaller cities and the towns and the suburbs and even the villages? How are those people going to get the message? Yeah. You know, so we need vegan activism everywhere. And so in order to get it everywhere, we have to have people in all these areas instigating it and getting together with other vegans say, come on, let's go and deliver some leaflets or let's go and kind of do an information stall at the local community event or something and kind of, you know, spread the message. And that's, to me, that's key. If we're going to achieve animal liberation, if, if somebody said to me, what, what one thing do I think is key to the achievement of animal liberation? I would really say how many vegans will become organisers and instigators of outreach. Yeah. To me, that's the number one <clears throat> thing. And when you say outreach, you mean spreading the word. I mean in spreading any way the possible. word. It do, you know, it yeah. does. You know, and it doesn't have to be in a big spectacular way. Mm. You know, some of the big spectacular things are great. You know, but in in a smaller in a in a smaller town or you know a suburb, stuff as simple as um, you know door dropping leaflets. You know, holding an information stall at the community fete or something. Mm. You know, booking a stall at a local dog rescue event at the local, you know, environmental fair or something like that. You know, so that you can or or you know, or on the streets. Are you, are you, you following know. Cam Beagle? Uh, oh yes, yeah. yes, so and I know they got outreach. What do you, yeah, what do you think there. of the national outreach uh, idea instigated I by think Mikey? It's, I think it's really, really good. I think it. Well, it, in fact, it reminded me of when we used to do greyhound action and um, you know we would do it very very similar stuff have people doing stalls pickets outside dog tracks um you know and leaflets and packs to give to people and businesses yeah so it was lovely to be able to kind of help his idea because it, it was really successful when we were doing it and i know that that is something that does need to happen where Camp Beagle is concerned and uh, vivisection more broadly, you know, I think it's a really, really good idea because it can't just stay at Camp Beagle. You've got to have a campaign around that. Otherwise, yeah. it, all that's going to happen is it's going to become a signpost place where cars go past and they see it and they toot and that's it. But <clears> it does yeah. need to go much, much wider um, than that. And I think it's it's brilliant, yeah. I really do. Yeah, and it's going to be cool. They're doing the one-off day, obviously, on the 9th of July, which is yeah. the coordinated outreach, yes. <laughs> simultaneous outreach across the country. Yeah. Which yeah. would be great, for, because that can all be shared on social it media can, and they can make a real, real thing of that. I mean, I think it's great in various ways. I mean, first yeah. of all, if you look, well, how are we going to end or, or even reduce animal experiments, you know, kind of how realistically, you know, you know, in a realistic way, how are we going to do that? And I think we have to involve the public in that yeah. um, for a number of reasons. And I think, first of all, you know, there are various things that we can ask the public to do. Um, people can boycott charities that fund animal experiments. You know, millions, if not billions of pounds go into it from, you know, these organisations like the British Heart Foundation, Cancer Research UK. Can educate people to boycott those. That's, mm. that's less money going into animal experiments. Yeah. Uh, people can give their support to um, organisations that promote non-animal research, you know, such as um, um, Animal Free Research and uh, Safe, Safe Medicines, Medicines is another yeah. very good one, and there's right. others. Um, you know, those two things that, that, uh, that you know, that people can actually do something to kind of, you know, make the situation, you know, Less it, bad. <laughs> it can be actually something that's really positive. If the campaign is done right, it can really, really uplift people's feelings as well. Because I think sometimes you're outside these places and it is heartbreaking and it does get you down. It really gets you down and it's horrific. Uh, and you can drive away thinking, oh my God, that's just awful. And that never really leaves you however old a campaigner you might be you've seen it so many times before 
and you just think, oh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. But having said that, you know, with campaigns like that, when it starts and then you kind of build up, it can be so positive, especially with bringing beagles along, getting the public to kind of think about it. I think, you know, it can, can really be a lovely, lovely experience for everybody involved and encourage people who may have thought that just doing social media is the only thing, the only way forward, but actually think, actually, do you know what? If this per if these people are going to give me the materials that I need, I mean, I love the idea of that. Yeah. yeah just, yeah. we are going to give you all the materials that you need. <clears throat> it's like, oh Fantastic. my God, that is heaven to my, you know, that <laughs> is music to my ears. That is heaven to me because the amount of times we've had to make up our own stuff you know, out of print stick and sellotape, you know, in the oh, yeah, past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And get Most our high, own materials. High photocopiers. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that yeah, is yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you know, or cutting, you know, <laughs> cutting it all in and, and oh, going, yeah, do you yeah, think yeah, we've yeah. got it right? And when you said, we're going to, we're going to give you all the materials that you need, it was like, <gasps> I mean, that's so. Oh my God, I love that, these people. Such a, Fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's so important. And it's it? so important because yeah. then you're not really giving anyone an excuse then because you're kind of going, no, no, we are going to give you the materials. You want to get involved, we'll give you the materials. Yeah. And that's that's brilliant as well. Yeah, that that is that is the key. It's, it's, it, that's very important. You know, it, because it, the the other thing about involving ordinary people is is like, how are we going to end this whole thing of animal experiments? How, how is that going to end? And it's going to end by laws being passed. We want it abolished, really. We want yeah. I mean, you know, there are attempts in Parliament at the moment to to end it, but the problem is, once again, um, going back to what I said before, which is the fundamental ideology of the government. The fundamental ideology of the government is like kind of in favour of the oppression of other animals. It's in favour of animal experiments, you know. And, and, and so to kind of move that to any great degree... I'm not saying that, you know, some small changes can be brought about that will spare, you know, a number of animals. But to move that to a great degree, you've got to get rid of those people and have other people that are kind of totally sympathetic to animal liberation. Because if the, the government's a species at their heart, which they are, mm. you know, you can't, you cannot, you can't win them over if they, they just haven't got any understanding of that. You know, they have these massive banquets. They sit there eating everything known to man on their plates. Mm -hmm you're not going to get anywhere so they're just going to look at animal testing and vivisection as like yeah whatever yeah yeah, you know? yeah there's, there's a, it's just a general attitude that we can exploit it's okay to exploit anything if it's for profit yes. and animals happen to be one of those things that, yes, and that's they're quite right, good yeah. it's a quite good product in that it will grow itself largely yeah, uh, yeah. And, it's, you yeah. Know, it's, and, and but you're talking and, about yeah. a massive massive corporate huge yeah. corporate it's the main, one of the main bastions of animal abuse Mm. you know it is you know huge pharmaceuticals kind of coming in and testing and doing what they want and no one questions it like the mafia if you go up against them my mm. god yeah. you you know you will get totally and utterly yeah, I, I do smashed. believe that the bigger corporations are actually running this show i think government government and parliament and pri you know, yeah. politicians are a kind of a facade to give an illusion of democracy mm. but really it's going to be the money because money is what everybody worships you know whoever's got yes. the most of it you're going to have the most power yeah. but something that yeah. gives me hope is that yeah. if the system is all about money then these profiteering corporations have always had the same mantra which is that customer is king mm. and that's us they will mm. follow us. If we move, they will follow us and they respond very quickly. That's why they invest a lot, so much in market research and real time market research because oh, they want to know exactly absolutely. what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And they will be shitting themselves over what's happening at MBR. They will be extremely worried about that in terms of beginning to open a door that's been firmly shut for about the last 20 years. The only mm. people that, you know, seriously took on. I'm not going to say not the only people because we were involved in the Perrycroft campaign. John and others have been involved in all kinds of yeah. nice. HLS stuff, the same as we mm. were. Um, so you know, but like Shaq was absolutely crucified once once the government got hold of them. Yeah. You know, they're brilliant activists, beautiful people, and they were just completely and utterly smashed. And 
and I used to say, I don't know how, I used to say to Natasha, I don't, or Heather, I don't know, or Sarah, Sarah Whitehead, I'd say, I don't know how you don't, I don't know how you, not at the bottom of a ravine, I don't know, how have they not cut your brakes yet, you know, <laughs> how, are you, how are you not dead? Yeah. Because it was just so, 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 uh, you know, they were so full on and they were just not giving the vivisection industry, pharmaceutical industry, the room to move. But it didn't really matter because at some point you knew the government were going to go, right, that's it, we've had enough of you, we just want you to stay where you are, protest is okay, as long as it doesn't change anything. Okay, yeah. that's yes, it's fine. Right. You have your yeah. protest as long as it doesn't change anything. Otherwise, if it does, then it's over. Game over. It's going to finish. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. And we were all yeah. waiting for that, and it did, yeah. yes. and in quite a dramatic way. Yes. And not only did it happen, but they also shored up Huntington. The government shored yeah, up did. Huntington Life Sciences, and, and it, it was mm. inevitable. You know, it will because it's and the it same. was inevitable. Yeah, because you've got a government that supports big business that supports corporations and and are, and are kind of the same people anyway yeah and that's their the ideology it's right, neoliberalism yeah. it's their ideology and so you're up against that and unless <clears throat> unless we change that and, and in terms of, of of the power of people as consumers changing what corporations do um we can see that happening in in terms of food in terms of um vegan food in terms of plant-based food yeah. so many of these corporations got richmond now you even got Frey bentos who was horrific yeah. animal oppressors in the world with their huge processing factories where live animals go in one end and, and literally and pies come out the other end mm. they, 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 oh they've got vegan pies now and richmond have got vegan sausages and nearly all the plant milks you can buy the companies that that kind of that, that produce them you know it's certainly the parent companies dairy companies because they're all jumping on the bandwagon they see the way things are going they're not at all interested in ethics but they see ah oh, you know pound. we want the green pound we want the vegan pound and that's the way things are going so we're going to kind of we're going so so, so consumer you know people as consumers you know are kind of transforming those companies but i think the difficulty with animal experiments is that People as consumers can't really have the same power. You know, to some extent they can, you know, with kind of, if you're talking about toiletries and household products and cosmetics, yes, you know, people can boycott them and make a choice of ones that aren't tested on animals. But when it comes down to drugs and pharmaceuticals and all these things, that's a difficult area because if someone's taking a tablet that comes from a, vivisection company that they think saves their life and might indeed be saving their life they're not going to stop doing so you see so you've got a difficulty in terms of consumer boycott with animal experiments i think i think we need to call out the healthcare system in general because it is a it is the healthcare system is all about money Mm -hmm. and it's and it's reactionary and it's palliative yeah and it's just about yeah we'll welcome sick people you get sick as much as you like you get sick but we'll just we'll just make money out of of treating your symptoms and giving you side effects uh, more side effects than any any results but there's no mention of prevention yes uh and what actually works no in actual fact it's really awful because when you look at it if you go into a doctor's and you say this, 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 and this is wrong with me. And nine times out of ten, it's something that's actually really quite curable. It's just through, you know, um, diet and the things that we do to to ourselves, you know, smoke, mm. drink, all the rest of it, stress on our lives, uh, all, of, yeah. all of those things. And then you go, well, is there any other way I can go? Is there any another way I can go? No, not really. And you think, oh, right, okay. Um, so there isn't a kind of a holistic approach. No, but we can give you these tablets. Yeah, and if you really cared, you'd be talking about prevention first. You'd be that would be about your that. focus, yes. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, totally the same as in hospital on in in wards, exactly the same. People are given quite basic food. No, it, and they'll have very very serious medical conditions. Yet they're not told about changing to a a, a much more healthier diet 
that's not they're not given a sheet to take home with them to say look this is what you really do need to do mm. and this is what we would ask you to do look at what's happening no none of that is said in mm. a hospital it's really really poor actually mm. how it's just neglected that side of it when there's actually still quite a lot you can do as an individual but of course mm. if you don't know that as an individual or your education isn't very good as an individual or you just don't understand and a lot of people are bamboozled by people in white coats even doctors they won't yeah. argue back they'll just go okay then that's fine just take these love and off you go off you toddle you know you yeah. can get bigger you can get heavier we don't really care because mm. you'll get sicker and we can then carry on giving it's, you the pills it, it's to more keep money taking, it's, more, it's money more money for money. their mates in the pharmaceutical industry isn't it? and this is the trouble once again you're back to the government you're back to the administration and their attitudes i mean it's a very um, very it's very the same, isn't it? yeah it's, it's just know. a very very wicked game uh, a lot of it is very very wicked mm. yeah you so from, going back to what you were saying earlier, that anarchism is clearly the answer for me anyway. But just like when you were talking about anarchism earlier, it just sounded like a concept which is just hundreds of years away. Uh, and, you know, it sounds so it sounds so <laughs> radical and future, but it does sound futuristic. It well, does sound where, that where we will be. There's, there's a, um, an ancient Chinese proverb, which I love, which is the, um, um, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Yeah, and so I think if you have an idea of what you want um, a society to be like, then no matter how far off that appears to be, then if you start the journey towards that, like eventually uh, you'll achieve it. But I, I think you have to kind of you have to go along the the right road, and and, and we we have to use the right tactics and strategy in and, order and, to achieve and, that. Yeah, and similarly, instead of being yeah. overwhelmed by the you know about the whole about the, your your country becoming more anarchist and more people centric. Instead of worrying about that happening, you can have that anarchy and autonomy in your own life as a microcosm, can't you? Well, I think it's it's, it's always a, a good thing to have a, as an example, and and yeah. and, and, and a, a really good thing to have anyway. Um, but it kind of it, it all really comes back to to educating ordinary people and 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 once back once again going back to the outreach tools can be good outreach tools um th th those can you know there's various levels at which those you know those tools that can educate people there's a level of educating people about you know what they can do themselves now in terms of at least trying to reduce the number of animal experiments you know through you know to where they put their money for instance or where they don't put their money mm. there's that and then I mean, also, if we could, if 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 those stores can kind of, you know, change those people more more fundamentally. I mean, I think those stores are an ideal opportunity to include vegan outreach, and I think it's really important that um, anyone that does any kind of stall on what might be termed a single issue, in, you know, whether it's you know um, anti vivisection, whether it's against the fur trade, whether it's against hunting or whatever. Yeah. That when people are given information about that particular issue, give them information about going vegan as well. Yeah. And I think that that's important for two reasons. First of all, because you know, if we if if we can get enough people to actually go vegan and adopt that philosophy, then we we can create huge change. You know, as I've already explained. Um. And 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 secondly, because um those stalls can attract people in a way that a stall that just said go vegan doesn't it's it's like you know cat beagle beagles yeah you know that's right and nearly everyone loves dogs they love beagles yeah uh, you know they're going to come to the stall and they're people who at least care about some animals there's some something there that can be worked with and so it, it would be a great shame to waste the opportunity to take that person further along that road yeah because so, because saving yeah. the beagles is only one part of it's, a big philosophy yeah. called veganism i, I see yeah. it as a gateway I, I i call these ways gates ways i mean there are some people that are into vegan campaigning that are very much against single issues say so we shouldn't be campaigning on single issues it should be all about veganism but i think that single issues as well as having value in themselves of course hmm. can can provide a gateway you know to veganism and and, and can provide a gateway for vegan education um 
but and, and all that has to be done is that along with the information about the, the the particular issue in this case it would be you know the, the campaign against MBR and, and yeah. experiments in general it would be, give those people there's you know, several vegan people education. at Camp Beagle have become vegan f- yeah. through, through yes. the dog yeah. through the dogs I, I think it's an ideal opportunity and I, I mean um, we should be and I think that isn't done enough I think people um, that are campaigning on single issues often forget about you know, don't take the opportunity because those people are very vegan who are campaigning on those issues. Mm. But when they're doing so, they don't take the opportunity to include vegan information in what they're doing, and and and, and it's a huge lost op- a lost opportunity to educate people and take people further along the road. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't seen it like that. But um, I, I, my my first thought was, oh, let's keep it simple. Let's not confuse the issue. Uh, or let's keep focus but actually I, I, I do agree with that yeah yeah and there's some very good materials I mean I mean, something I'm always going on about because we use it all the time in our campaigns is I mean I'm like produced this booklet called Plant Based Cooking on a Budget and it looks like a recipe booklet there's lovely pictures of vegan food on the front there's yeah. affordable recipes because yeah. a lot of people say oh I, I couldn't afford to be vegan yeah, yeah. and in fact it's the cheapest diet of all if you do it in the, know how to do it you know? yeah but then further on in the book, it's about the ethical reasons for veganism. You know, what happens to the animals? There isn't anything um, graphic in there, but it's what happens to the animals, why it's wrong, and the ethical reasons for veganism, and and then about health and the environment and all these things. And so it's a brilliant booklet to give to people because it's not threatening. People think, oh, thank you very much. You know, oh, can I really have this? You know, and, and I think there's other organisations probably produce similar materials. Um, but for instance, I mean, we've we've done stalls where we've been campaigning against the budget card and getting people to sign a petition, getting people to, you know, join, you know, get involved in with the activists to try and stop the card and things like that. Yeah, but you see, and, that was yeah. again. Sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, no, no, you, no. But um, that that again, you see, was a little bit like Camp Beagle in that you had people that were just interested in badgers and what was mm. happening to the badgers. Yeah. And they didn't correlate between the dairy industry and the badger cult. Yeah. yeah. And then somebody gave them like leaflets. And we know that because people would come forward and they'd say, oh, I wasn't vegan before this. I wasn't mm. vegan before or the badger cult, you know, but now I can see the link between the dairy industry and the badger cult. You know, even even Brian May from Queen. Yeah, he's gone you vegan. You know, he's now, gone so. vegan because, he, he, mm. you know, that connection was made because somebody kept saying, you need to go vegan. You need to look at this. Any reason why these animals are dying is through the dairy industry and through the farmers killing them. So, and he did. He made mm. that connection. So, yeah, it is. It is crucial. It is crucial. But also on the street, mm. you know, with the public, you've got people coming up who care about badgers. You know, yeah, they care so about. They're, they're not people who don't, don't give a shit about anything. They care about badgers. They come <laughs> to sign the petition. Yeah. They want to know how can I help the badgers. We'll give them information about the badgers and just include. I used to do stalls many years. I did stalls for whale and dolphin protection. And um, one of the reasons I did those stalls was quite deliberate that I knew that they'd attract a lot of people who cared about at least some animals. Yeah, because a lot of people love dolphins. Yeah. And yeah. whales and dolphins, yeah. So <laughs> I'd have all the whale and dolphin right? stuff, all the petitions and all that. And then when I said, would you like an information, some information? And a, a lot, I, I, some people say, I don't want anything graphic. So I'd have to kind of maybe not give them certain leaflets yeah but you know i'd kind of but in that information pack there'd be a leaflet about veganism yeah you see uh and so i mean how many people went vegan because of that i'm sure i'm sure they did you know people did yeah um, don't underestimate uh, uh, the, the uh, impact uh, a, le- one, a single leaflet can have on a well, person's, I know, I, person's I, I, course I'm, of life I, right? I, I mean i know people yeah. including some very good activists that went vegan because they found a leaflet on a bus yeah and no um, good friend of mine good activist went vegan because um he found a leaflet in his mum's purse that she picked up at a stall on the high street right. and ironically yeah. it was his mum asked him to take her purse and pay the milkman right who was at the door <laughs> okay <laughs> and while he went to get the money out of the purse he found this leaflet yeah and that kind of led him to becoming like a vegan activist yeah you know, so it's a Lovely story that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, and so many times, you know, these little things that we kind of don't know. Um, you know, we tend not to get, you know, a lot of feedback. 
The sad thing is you're yeah, never really but... going to know what kind of impact you've had. You know, you can mm, only yeah. guess at what kind of impact, Yeah. you know, in terms of education, like the activism that, that educates people. You're never going to truly know. No. You just hope that your legacy... You, you, you kind of know that it, it, it does work, though. You, you yeah. kind of... I, I don't particularly need to have exact figures myself. I know some people think it's handy to kind of have some means of knowing what effect they've had because I know it does have an effect yeah you know I know because the, the the reason why any of us who have become vegan the reason we became vegan was because we received information and that could have been yeah. for me it was an article in a magazine but for other people it could be a leaflet um it could be even a poster they saw it could be um a video on YouTube or it could be a friend saying something uh it could be you know, like a television and Viva have done really good television ad recently. It could mm. be something like that. Mm. Um, but it was a receipt of information. So the more information we put out there about veganism and, and reasons to go vegan, inevitably more people will become vegan. Yeah, yeah. it's inevitable sure. because that's how we became vegan. Yeah, you know. So we have to have as much information as we can, as often as possible, and you know. Um, wherever we possibly can mm. all the time and, and once again that's back to as many vegans as possible being involved in spreading that information because you know our enemies you know the people that want to oppress animals you know the the you know the meat industry the dairy industry um the, the people involved in experimentation hunting and all these people right they've got the money you know they've got the money that they can pay for these adverts especially the, the meat and dairy industry all these adverts on the television all the time you know eat meat and drink milk and eat cheese and all that they've got the money and we haven't got that money i think we've been, we've got more money in the movement than we used to have yeah you know and you know some you know funding for groups and that from some quite wealthy vegans these days but it still doesn't match anywhere near no. what the the other side have but what we have got that they haven't got is numbers. We've got numbers. Yeah. You know, we have hundreds mm. of thousands, millions of people who are vegan. We've got we've got the numbers, and we've got enough numbers that can completely overwhelm their money if enough vegans became active in spreading the message. Yeah. yeah. And that is really crucially important. Yeah. So we'll just we'll keep plugging on. Yep. You know it's working. <laughs> you know it's the right thing to do, and it's and it's uh, yes. a great way to spend your life. Yeah. Well, you see, what you, you see to me, what is a better way to live? You know that we we have a situation on Earth of horrendous oppression, of like a tyrant species. Like I'd say, really a Nazi species, the human species. Mm, yeah, that's kind yeah. of crushed and oppressed. You know, for thousands of years, and it's got worse and worse and worse and worse as time's gone on. All the other animal species this horrendous oppression and so to kind of spend your life or, or or at least some of your life you know or as much as your life as you can you know fighting against that and changing that what's a better way to live mm. what other way really is there to live authentically than to otherwise you're living in a kind of false reality yeah to kind of ignore that thing well i'm going to get on and i'm going to do all these things and i'm going to kind of ignore that well, yeah. well you that's know, a kind of living in a both, fake world. You, can, you kind of feel in the moment, don't you? Because you, yeah, yeah, you're, you're working for the well, current you're issue. You're part yeah. of the. You're trying to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that's really what it's about. Yeah. You know, you want to know that when you finally close your eyes and say goodbye to this planet that you tried your very best while you were here and that's what it's about it's mm -hmm. about doing the very best that you can do as a person and spreading it to others as best you can mm -hmm. that message yeah. of caring sharing and being vegan and making the world a better place for all to live yes. in yeah. and that is what you want as a legacy I don't want money that's what I want I want people to recognise the that myself and others, you included, mm. all try to do our very best while we were here because that's all we can do in that sense. Lots of people, for some reason, we all think we're going to live forever or they mm. think they're all going to live forever and nobody really talks about dying, death or a legacy. But it's about leaving 
the right kind of legacy. Yeah. You know, being on the right the, the right side of history, you know, yeah. saying that we did yeah. do what we could do whilst we were alive. That's right. And now we pass that baton on to you, the next generation. It's over for us. You have to carry our message on. And that's what you leave as your legacy. Yeah, mm. that's right. Really I think so the, the, other, the other important thing is to, you know, the importance of activism is, is where people are kind of passively vegan. You know, they believe in animal liberation, but and, and, and they avoid animal products and they, they won't go to the animal circus and they won't bit on the races and they do, you know, they do all this avoidance yeah. you know, stuff, right? Um is, is I think it's important to realise that that is just a neutral position. You know, it's a neutral position. And the reason why it's a neutral mm. position is those people are refraining from doing things that they shouldn't be doing anyway. They yeah. should, nobody should be doing That's those right. things anyway, yeah. any more than nobody should be a mugger, any more than nobody should be a child molester. And I, I wouldn't say to anyone, oh, I'm a really good guy. And they'd say, well, why are you a really good guy? And I'd say, well, because I... Um, I don't mug people and I don't mess, <laughs> molest children. So aren't I a good guy? And people would go, well, no, hang on a minute. That doesn't make you a good guy. You should, <laughs> you should be doing those things anyway. <laughs> you, know, right. well, you know, like, so not being bad isn't being good. Not being bad is only being neutral. So if you're, if, if someone's going to kind of be good, it's going to be kind of have, you know, positivity in their life. They've got to do more than just avoiding things. Yeah. And the, and the way to actually kind of be good, you know, to be to live a positive life is through activism, is through spreading the vegan message, and then your life becomes positive rather Take than just action. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to wrap up the interview, just quickly, what's how do you feel about the future? How do I feel about <laughs> the future? Oh gosh, it's a bit of a mixed bag for me. Probably Ronnie's going to be more positive than I would be, but <laughs> you know, if we're not all nuked by Putin. Um, you know, then yeah, I, 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 you know, I'd love to be really, really positive, and I hope that you know I'm proved wrong. I think we're on a very sticky path, and I think it's going to be very uncomfortable. Um, but I do want to be positive, and I do have a positive message in that. Keep up your activism. You know, don't never give up. A really good friend to me said years ago, never give up. However bad it might be or however painful the journey is, never give up. So never give up. Mm. Love life as best you can. Yeah. Be with your friends as well. Take breaks. Take time out. Yep. Love the animals around you. Love your friends. Love your family. Don't take anything for granted and remain positive after me saying all of what I've just said, but <laughs> remain positive, <laughs> remain positive. I mustn't be downbeat because I, I could be, but I, I really, really do mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, The that's people important. at Camp Beagle as well, you know, just keep going, keep plodding because that's what we've got to do because there's yeah. no other alternative. So that's mm. it. Mm. And I mean, yeah. I agree totally with all of that. I think it's really important to be positive. You know, being negative isn't going to do anything. We've got to go for it. You know, we don't know whether we're going to be successful or not. But I think there is a clear road. I, th I think it's not like it's not an impo it's not an impossible it's not an impossibility. I think um, we could achieve an animal liberationist society. We could achieve a society where basically where vegans are in control and where we call the shots. And so either people, you know, um, want animal liberation or that they're, they're not able to oppress animals because they're because we stop them from doing so, you see. Um, because there's, we, we have, we, you know, there's enough of us and, and we have enough strength to be able to do that. Um, and, and I think the, the, the achievement of that society is very possible. I think it's very possible to achieve that society. But I think we've just got to um, uh, follow, a, follow a route that will lead to that. Mm. If we follow a route that will lead to that, we'll achieve it. And as I said, the route, the route to that is, is is vegan education, and and once again, it kind of really comes down to whether or not we we achieve that world. Really comes down to um, having sufficient vegans involved in outreach, and even more importantly, having enough vegans that will be the instigators and organisers of that. That's that's kind of what we can do it, 
it's very possible whether we will do it or not really Mine's depends on all those vegans out there and, and you know if, mm. you know you know there, there will be a lot of vegans hopefully listening to that and i'd say to them look you know if if you're not active get get active and and you know if you're you're an activist but you're not an organizer and not an instigator then then become an organizer and instigator and, and do that in your own area where you live yeah and let's get as much outreach going as possible and and, and, and we can do it yeah we can do it so it would be fair to say, Ronnie Lee says, veganism is neutral and uh, personal change leads to system change. Yeah, ve- ve- veganism, <laughs> in, ve- veganism, veganism in terms of... Or a vegan of, diet is neutral, how about that? Yeah, well, veganism, <laughs> not just a diet, I'd say veganism even as, a, even as a philosophy, even if people believe in animal liberation, mm. right? If, 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 if all they do is um, avoid things... You know, uh, uh, in other words, if they say I'm not going to partake in any of those things, yeah, you know, and that's the limit of my veganism, yeah, then that is neutral, yeah, because they're only doing what they should. They're only not doing what they shouldn't be doing anyway. Yeah, <laughs> to be positive, you've got to do outreach. You've got to go out there. You've got to spread the message, because you know it's great to not be part or to to do one's best to avoid being part of the oppression of other animals. That's great. But what about all those other people that are still doing it? Yeah. Unless we change them, unless we do something about them, then it's never going to end. And so we have to be active. Great. Positive ending. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> thank you so much. You two are just beautiful people. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>